Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Jordan Gebhardt, an assistant professor at Kansas State University. So Jordan, I know you were just recently on the show, but before we get started, would you mind giving the audience a short introduction about yourself? Absolutely. And as mentioned, I'm Jordan Gebhardt. I'm an assistant professor here at Kansas State University. I'm a swine veterinarian and nutritionist on staff and uh, help conduct some of our research related to swine nutrition, production management, as well as feed safety here at Kansas State. I appreciate the chance to visit this morning about some statistics concepts. Gotcha. So like you just said, let's talk a little bit about statistical analysis. So I know this might not be everyone's uh, favorite part when it comes to our line of research, but it definitely is an important one. So what would you say are some of the main shortcomings with statistical analysis? Absolutely. And, and as we talked about a little bit in the, our previous recording, the concept of experimental design is, is very, very important. We need to have the statistical component in mind when we design our experiments. But then also, once we have that information, the statistical analysis of, is a very important step to make sure that we can interpret our data properly. One of the first and, and uh, biggest issues that I see with uh, working with graduate students and conducting statistical analysis has nothing to do with the model complexity, the model assumptions. It actually starts at the very beginning of the statistical analysis process. Getting that information and getting that data into the statistical program we're using, we it's easy to overlook that step. It seems very, very simple or straightforward, but actually we can have some pretty significant issues arise during that process. And one of the biggest challenges when getting data, for example, from Excel into SAS or into R or any other program, it's very hard to find issues. If we have missing observations, for example, in our data set for something like carcass data, sometimes those show up as zeros. If we read that data directly into our statistics program and analyze the data, if there are some of those things like a zero, we may not notice that. Um, but it nonetheless would be incorporated into that analysis and be very difficult to detect. Therefore, I think visualizing the data that we're using is really, really important. Something like box plots or histograms can help us detect some of those outliers or even prior to that, just true data entry or data handling errors. So one of the first and and foremost areas to start with statistical analysis is making sure we get our data into the program we're using properly and uh, and making sure we're not having the issues within that step. One of the next important pieces of statistical analysis where issues can sometimes arise is when we specify that statistical model. There's processes that are used to generate that data, certain aspects about the design structure. Did we include any, any blocking factors or blocking parameters within our trial? Did we have multiple barns of pigs? Um, Do we have other complex uh, trial design aspects such as subsampling or pseudo replication or repeated measures? I think one of the very important parts about statistical analysis is sitting down when you begin the analysis and very clearly write out what different aspects of that trial design are, both design aspects as well as treatment aspects. Do we have blocking, subsampling, pseudo replication? What's our experimental unit? What's our observational unit? And have that all clearly written down on paper. And then from there, building the model is a relatively straightforward step. But if we skip that process or move through that process too quickly of truly understanding what the data we're working with is, that is where I see some issues arise as it relates to statistical analysis. So when building models, make sure you have a firm and thorough understanding of the process used to generate the data within the experiment. A leader in swine nutrition solutions driven by science. Novus's products and services look at the whole animal, focusing on productivity and well-being in order to feed the world affordable and wholesome food. For more information, visit Novus's website at www.novusint.com. So I guess in, in short, um, what, how would you define the difference between an experimental unit and an observational unit? Absolutely. That's a, a terrific point that is, 
it seems oftentimes quite confusing. The way that I like to think about it, though, is is the experimental unit is the smallest physical entity, the smallest thing that we can randomize to a treatment independent of all other things we're working with. For a nutrition trial, for example, if we're assigning a certain diet to a feeder, which is a pen of pigs, that entire pen of pigs is the experimental unit because an individual pig within that pen is not independent of the other pigs within that pen as well. So in that case, the smallest unit assigned to treatment independent of other things is a pen. Something like an antibiotic injection trial, for example, where pigs in a pen can be on different treatments, something like that, the pig can be the experimental unit because it's independent of other pigs within that cohort or within that pen of, of animals. So that's the experimental unit. How do we randomize and how do we assign treatments to things? The observational unit, simply put, is just the thing we measure. Um, we can measure pen weights of pigs or we can measure an individual weight of pigs. The OU or observational unit simply is what does one row of data within your data set represent? Or in other words, what is the thing you're measuring? Sometimes the EU and the OU can be the same thing. That, that makes it pretty easy. A, a pen of pigs is our experimental unit. We take pen weights or group weights. That's relatively straightforward. The EU and OU can be different things. An experimental unit, say, in a trial would be a pen, but then we take individual pig carcass data at the processing plant. So we have multiple observations within each experimental unit. We call that pseudo-replication or subsampling, and there's nothing wrong with it. We certainly can account for it within our statistical model, but it's not the straightforward EU equals OU situation, and our model needs to be a little bit more complex. So inherently, those the EU and OU defining those are a critical first step um, in writing out what those are, and then once you have that, are they the same thing? Are they different? Then generating and building the model is, is a piece of cake. One of the next important areas um, is it relates to statistical analysis that is really important to consider um, is related to the assumptions of the statistical test we're doing. In many cases, we're doing an ANOVA or an analysis of variance, and that ANOVA has certain assumptions in order for, for our interpretation to be valid. Some of those would be is the underlying population in which you're sampling does is that data or that thing you're measuring is it continuous or meaning is it a number like weight pigs have a weight they can be 100 pounds 101 102 etc so it's a continuous data and we also many times assume that it's normally distributed or follows a bell-shaped curve in many cases in biology that's a very very relevant assumption but there are some situations where that assumption may not be valid in that case, where our data is not normal, something like a data transformation can help fix that assumption or allow us in, our, in the course of interpretation not to violate that specific assumption. Other important assumptions we need to think about, making sure that those independent, uh, those observations that we measure, those pieces of data are independent of each other, as well as assuming that our treatments have an equal level of variation among between those treatments, so an equal variance between treatments. It's very easy to skip this whole process of fitting the model and evaluating our assumptions, but it is a very important step. And we can do that many times through visual assessment of studentized residual plots, for, for example. So the, it's not always black and white or clear cut. Is that variation, that variance equal enough or is it different? Do we need to account for it specifically or not? Um, it's not black and white, but it is an important step to make sure that the assumptions we're making are in fact valid. Yeah, and with the variance too, especially when you're working with animals, it's 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 very hard to make it perfect with the variance. Absolutely, and and with the law of large numbers, if if we have a large enough population, generally the assumption of no normality is is fully valid, equal variance fully valid. Depending on structural limitations or limitations of our experiment where we have a, a smaller sample size than what would be we would like or be ideal, that's when we run into some of these um, violations of assumptions is that when our sample size is, is a little bit too small uh, in order that it's not properly reflecting the true underlying biological process. 
as it relates to normality or, or equal variance. So it's a it's a balance. It's not a, a clear cut answer related to model assumptions, but it is an important consideration to think about when performing a statistical analysis. And then finally, what, one of the important areas that uh, once we run the statistical analysis using the program where you're choosing, we've read the data in, the model looks beautiful, assumptions and residual plots, plots look great. We get our, our values we, to interpret, we, we get our hypothesis tests, our p-values, uh, we write it all up in a table and then we're good to go. One of the important considerations on the very tail end of a statistical analysis that I think is important to consider is understanding the limitations of data. Uh, and, and, uh, and one of the important pieces of that is, what is the underlying population that was used to conduct your experiment? If you apply treatments to a certain population of pigs of a specific genetic makeup or a specific age, weight, certain environmental conditions, those research results certainly apply to those conditions, but those research results may or may not be able to be extrapolated to a wider or, or larger population. Again, this isn't something that's black and white, but understanding the specific situation and the potential limitations of data that's generated through an experiment, I think is a very, very important aspect to understanding and interpreting data and knowing what to do with it. Another metric here in terms of understanding what data means is that many different variables we can calculate different ways. A simple example is something like average daily gain, where we can do, um, if we have pigs that die or are removed from a trial, do we count the weight that those pigs gained within our average daily gain calculation, or do we not more on a closeout basis? There's pros and cons to both methods, but understanding when you're given a data set, understanding how that data was generated and how that data was calculated, those metrics were calculated, is very, very important in your interpretation of that data. LBiotics, the pioneer postbiotic for digestive health in pigs. Brought to you by Adair Biome. With over a century of experience in postbiotics for digestive health, LBiotics contains heat-treated lactobacillus cell bodies and their metabolites. Stable by nature, LBiotics can be easily stored and incorporated in compound feed. So just, I guess, just having a plan, I'd, I'd agree that just having a plan before you go in and making sure that you're trying to make it as accurately as possible without um, influencing one treatment over the other is, um, yeah, very important. Absolutely. And, and so those are some of the key areas that uh, as I work with students and, and work on statistical analysis and swine nutrition, swine production medicine, those are some of the key areas that, that I try to, to help students understand early on in their programs to ultimately have the, the greatest success and, uh, and most valid interpretation of, of the interpretation of all the hard work that goes into conducting a trial. Yep. Well, I believe that's all we have time for, Jordan. So thank you for coming on the show and discussing this with me. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yep. And everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey everyone, we're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details about your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Oh.